Hello, wherever you may be. My greetings to you from the city of Dublin in Ireland. My name is Nigel Johnston and I'm delighted to be with you for this short video presentation. This is the first of a two-part series on the broad theme of Irish emigration to Canada in the 19th century. In this presentation, I will be looking especially at the decades running up to or preceding the Great Famine of 1845 to 1849. To assist us on our journey, we will enjoy, for example, some readings from personal letters, a poem and an interview. I really do hope you can stay with me for the whole trip. Before I go any further, let me say my presentation is undertaken on behalf of the Ireland Canada Monument Committee of Vancouver, an organisation concerned, as you might guess, with erecting a memorial to the Irish men and women who came to live in that region of Canada. To quote from the official website, their primary objective is to recognise and celebrate the significant contribution of Irish Canadians and Canadians of Irish descent to Canada. In a little while, I'll introduce you to Esther North, an energetic Canadian lady who's happy to boast about her real Irish roots. She has made a significant contribution to the Ireland Canada Monument website through extensive research and biographical inquiry. Before I introduce Esther, I need recognise the long-standing commitment of several key people behind the Ireland Canada Monument in Vancouver. At the forefront are Brendan Flynn and Eddie Reynolds, who came together to form the project about 15 years ago. Over time, they were ably supported by a number of very talented individuals such as Claire Fox and Susan Watacorn, and of course up until very recently by David O'Sullivan and William Don Elan. Let's turn our attention now to a brief explanation of the background to the monument. We're going to hear from ICM co-founder Eddie Reynolds. He is speaking from outside All Hallows College in Drumcondra, Dublin. Uh, the reason why I'm uh, doing this at the video is just to let you know that some years ago, back in 2005, uh, President Mary McAleese uh, was visiting Vancouver I got an invitation to travel with her, unfortunately I couldn't at the time, but I did contact Brandon Flynn uh, to let him know, my good friend Brandon Flynn in Vancouver, and uh, it presented one difficulty and that was uh, we didn't have an Irish centre or any place of specific interest to the Irish uh, in Vancouver to uh, welcome her, to welcome Mary McAleese at the time. But it, put, it, it planted a nice idea in our heads and that was that uh, for all the many people over uh, the last 200 years and more, uh, the, the Irish people who contributed to the great success of Canada, uh, that we should have something to commemorate uh, and to remember these people by. Uh, and eventually we came to the conclusion that the best thing to do is to organise the Ireland-Canada Monument. Uh, the Vancouver Parks Board have been fantastic in terms of uh, accommodating and facilitating uh, various locations, but the one that was eventually chosen was the, the lovely George Wainburn Park. Uh, so, just to say to you that we know, uh, we, we expect that it's going to be uh, unveiled, so to speak, in 2021. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to that. It's an exciting time, but it's it's a very difficult time at the moment for the whole world because of the COVID-19 problem. We have one small uh, concern, and uh, uh, and it's a concern that everybody has when they try to do something of significance, and that is where do we get the money? So we do have to raise money uh, initially. We know that we will get support from all the various organisations. Uh, uh, commercially and indeed uh, at uh, county level etc uh, back here in Ireland. What we would ask you to do is uh, to visit the website of the Ireland Canada Monument in Vancouver. Uh, you'll see on the website that there's an opportunity to, uh, to help us in whatever way you can. Uh, we're not 
we don't particularly want to have a begging bowl or anything like that. We just simply want to give you an opportunity uh, to participate in what we're trying to do here. We're trying to do something which is important and which is very much for uh, the, the, uh, the memory of Ireland in Canada and its great contribution to the years. Uh, so I wish you all the very best uh, and many thanks indeed. My thanks to Eddie for those important insights into the progress of the monument. The slide now on screen shows the ICM website where you can find more details of the project. It also contains a wealth of information on the Irish men and women who made their home in Canada. In a peculiar way, emigration is almost synonymous with being Irish. In fact, Ireland lost over 8 million people to emigration between the years 1801 and 1921. Today, it is said that as many as 70 million people living abroad actually claim a family link with Ireland. That is a significant number. If we take a closer look at the phenomena of Irish emigration abroad, we find that roughly speaking, Canada was the most popular destination up to the advent of the Great Famine of 1845 to 1849. Following that, until the eve of the Second World War, the United States was the preferred option. Thereafter, the United Kingdom was the most popular destination. Those are, of course, big brush strokes, and Canada remained an attractive option for many Irish men and women throughout the wider period. And now we're going to take a brief intermission. While doing so, we're going to listen to a snippet from an Irish traditional music tune named Boil the Breakfast Early by Leo Rosum. You will find that tune and many other items of interest on the website of the Irish Traditional Music Archive in Dublin. I do hope you enjoyed that brief glimpse into the Garden of Remembrance, a little piece of tranquillity located in Parnell Square, central Dublin. The garden itself was designed by Dahi Hanley and the wonderful sculpture by Oshin Kelly. The sculpture is an artistic representation of the legend The Children of Lure, which tells of four children being transformed into swans. They remained in that state for a period of 900 years before regaining their human form. Or at least that's how the story goes. The increasing demand by Irish men and women for a new life abroad in Canada was, of course, willingly aided by those in the shipping trade. Indeed, advertisements from owners of passenger vessels or their agents were in circulation in the public press from the late 18th century and onwards. An example of one such operator is Francis Taggart, who had offices in both Dublin and Belfast in 1815. Over the following 12 years, his business expanded to include Cork, Limerick, Oma, Liverpool and New York. Irish settlers moving to Canada throughout the 19th century and beyond often faced severe adjustments in lifestyle and sometimes quite dramatic personal challenges. Letters penned by these pioneering Irish immigrants frequently contain details of family life in the new frontier. Such letters often contain personal news and occasionally might touch on the extraordinary. A case in point is represented in a letter written by Mary Cumming of Petersburg in Ontario. She wrote to Margaret Craig of the town of Lisburn in County Antrim on the 24th of February 1812. Esther will now read some extracts from her letter.
This has been so dreadful a winter on this coast. But I hope sincerely that the first ship from Ireland will bring the much long for pocket. You have little or no idea what cold weather is in Ireland. For a few days this winter, the cold was so intense that water froze in the room we constantly sit in. And a large pitcher was broken by the frost, though it was on the sideboard near the fire. But ah, this weather did not last. I have begun to my garden and I hope to get the seeds to put down. I was very busy the other day, nailing up roses and jessamine in my little flower garden. I intend having it very nice. The more I know of the inhabitants of Petersburg, the more I like them. They are extremely friendly and social. I think my acquaintance will be almost too numerous soon. I received an invitation to attend the birth night ball on Friday last, but declined going. I do not care for dancing so much as I once did. Have we got our winter store of pork six weeks ago? We never think of cutting a ham here. They are just large enough to boil whole. We keep all the bacon in tops for five weeks and then put it all in the smokehouse there to remain. There must be a little fire in almost every day for two months. There have been no less than three earthquakes since I came here. Two happened a fortnight ago. There is great work here in winter getting the ice houses fitted. There is no living without ice in summer, I am told. Do you know the greatest comfort and amusement I have when alone is building castles of what I will do when I go home? For this is the burden of my song. What happy scenes I picture to myself when I am again in dear, dear Ireland. Do you know, I love to listen to the rain beating against the windows. It reminds me of my own dear country. We are fortunate that such letters still survive in archives around the country. A good source is the Irish Emigration Database, hosted by the Mellon Centre for Migration Studies. As you can see, this is a screenshot of the website. Newspapers, pamphlets and books were a major source of information for would-be departees. In his Hints on Emigration to Upper Canada, published in Dublin in 1832, Martin Doyle described Canada as, I quote, a place where man's industry is sure of full remuneration, where toil is recompensed, and where he can easily acquire capital and independence, end of quote. Such became the accepted wisdom and the circulation of optimistic reports throughout much of Ireland operated as a strong pull factor in favour of crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Conversely, it is not difficult to identify the push factors, for poverty was endemic throughout much of Irish society, rent and taxes were high, and government and landlords alike were regularly accused of despotism. Others still sought refuge overseas due to local intimidation or religious persecution. As fate would have it, despite Doyle's wishful thinking, the year 1832 was not at all good for Irish immigrants to Canada. Indeed, those who survived the voyage to Quebec met most distressing scenes upon arrival on shore. The extract that Esther will read for us next is from a memoir left by Mary McLean Walsh, originally of County Leitrim. After a lifetime in the new country, she left her early memories of coming to Canada with daughter Sarah Kerwin of Ottawa. Her memoir was recorded about the year 1890. On the 
10th of May, 1832, my parents, with their eight children, sailed from Ireland. Although the other passengers fared very well, and notwithstanding, I was a perfectly healthy Irish girl of 16. During the whole voyage of one month, I was ill. We were very much relieved to be landed in Quebec. But imagine our feelings at finding ourselves in a plague-stricken city, where men, women and children, smitten by cholera, dropped in the streets to die in agony, where business was paralyzed, not prevailed but sorrow mingled with dread and gloom. People passed by us, each holding between their teeth a piece of stick, and as thick as the stem of a clay tobacco pipe, on the end of which was stuck a piece of smoking tar. We learned that this was used as a preventative. My father, seeing my weakness, engaged rooms nearby. The following morning, I was advised to dress and walk slowly on the wharf, which I did, and was passing a heap of coal there when suddenly, blinded and speechless, I was unconscious and fell against it. The captain of our ship was standing near, talking to another gentleman. He ran forward and raising my head, he told his friend to bring from the ship as quickly as possible a tumbler full of brandy with a teaspoon of red pepper strewed through it. I was now in a veritable house of torture where the most appalling shrieks groans, prayers, and curses filled the air continually. While in the recovery sheds, we were allowed daily the juice of six lemons and a handful of peppermints. My father brought me a fresh supply of both each morning, and at the end of a week, he was told he might take me away. As I walked for the last time in the hospital yard, I saw burning there cholera tainted rich velvet and silk gowns, costly bonnets and shawls, children's clothing, the rags of the poor, gorgeous uniforms, boots with spurs attached, and all else which formed a pile almost as high as an ordinary house. As I watched the flames creep upward, I realized that before me was indeed a shocking proof of the ravages of the plague. One question remains, in view of their poverty, how did Irish men and women raise the means to emigrate? Well, it would seem a reasonable proportion did so entirely out of their own resources or savings. A not insignificant number did it on the strength of funds provided by a near relative already living in Canada. In other cases, help from a landlord was to prove a vital support. Although critics of such schemes saw a desire for estate clearance as the real reason for offering aid. Public subscription or parish assistance also played a part in certain cases, as did full or partial subvention by government. One of the best known government assisted schemes was undertaken by Peter Robinson, who was superintendent of emigration with the Colonial Department London in England. In the event, a group numbering 2,592 immigrants were brought from the province of Munster to Upper Canada in the years 1823 and 1825. Taken as a whole, it proved to be quite a costly experiment, for when all expenses were calculated, the total came to about £20 per head. Some further examples are provided in the letters and documents of the Chief Secretary's registered papers, 
covering the years 1818 to 1833. An online search of the collection, using the Crowley website, will return 265 matches for the word Canada. These returns reveal a high concentration of applications to government for financial assistance. For example, take a petition from Thomas Lipset, a farmer from the town of Ballyshannon in County Donegal. He is asking Dublin Castle to provide a vessel to carry a number of families from Killybegs Harbour across the water to a settlement in Upper Canada. His petition is on behalf of 16 families, who together constitute a total of 118 persons. In keeping with the usual convention, he assures government of his everlasting loyalty and support. The precise date is not stated, but the year is 1818. The reference number incidentally is CSO RP 1818412. However, Irish immigrants made their way to the new world of Canada one thing for sure is they continue to come and continue to build new communities. Whether by accident or design, these new settlements often mirrored those they left behind in Ireland, especially in terms of religion and politics. Statistics give us our strongest impression of the growing Irish communities. It is estimated by the year 1842, for example, between 120,000 and 134,000 Irish-born settlers were living in the city of Ontario. To put this in perspective, this figure was more than a quarter of the total population of the city. The legacy of Irish emigration left an indelible mark on many of those who stayed at home too. Needless to say, adventure stories from the past about Irish people making their journey across the water were passed down the generations. One such account was provided by Frank McKenna of Kilty Creva in County Longford. He received the information in question from his father. According to McKenna, and I quote, in the year 1839, there was one of the biggest windstorms ever known in Ireland. There was a man named John McGrace going to Canada, and he was accompanied by a man named Patrick Lennon from Esker. When they went on board, the big wind rose and the ship was blown against a rock. The ship sunk and none of them was heard of any more. End of quote. Certainly, the damage done across the country on the night of the big wind of the 6th of January 1839 is well attested to in other historical sources. But what about the fate of the ship that allegedly perished off the coast? Well, official records show that 37 deaths took place at sea on that fatal night. My own research on irishshipwrecks.com indicates that three vessels were lost or wrecked off the Irish coast in 1839. Although the precise date is not certain, two were wrecked on the Shannon Estuary in County Clare and another at Bortonport in County Donegal. McKenna's story, together with much else of Irish interest, can be found in the school's collection on the website ducas.ie. This is the most fascinating digital repository of items selected from the National Folklore Collection at University College Dublin. The centerpiece of that eye-catching fountain you've just been watching are the heralds of the four provinces of Ireland, all with trumpet in hand.
The water feature, together with the nearby bronze statue, are dedicated to the memory of Thomas Davis, a writer, composer and founder of the Young Ireland movement in mid-19th century Ireland. For many onlookers, that memorial on College Green, Dublin, brings to mind Davis's best-known song, A Nation Once Again. It was designed by Edward Delaney and unveiled in 1966. One of the strongest impressions you get by looking at the website of the Ireland-Canada Monument Committee is that the former nation gave an abundance of intellectual and literary talent to the adopted one. One of the more interesting persons to fit this description is the writer and poet Edward Hartley Dewart. He was born in Stradone, County Cavan in 1828. Dewart emigrated with his parents to Upper Canada in 1834 and just over 20 years later was ordained to the Wesleyan Methodist Church in London, Ontario. He acted as editor for the Christian Guardian and much of his literary output, his poems and essays, concentrated on religious themes as was consistent with his life's calling. In one of his poems, Erin Remembered, published in 1869, it is possible to trace both a residual nationalism for his adopted country, together with a longing for his actual place of birth. Now, once again, with the help of Esther, let's listen to a couple of verses for ourselves. Fair Canada, land of the maple and pine, though liberty, grandeur, and beauty are thine, Yet in sweet, dreamy sadness, my thoughts often roam to revisit loved Erin, my country, my home. Though the wide ocean parts from that beautiful isle, yet memory and fancy oft sweetly beguile, and bear me on pinions of rapture to gaze on the scenes where I sported in youth's sunny days. From what we have seen then, there is surely no disputing the huge impact the wandering Irish made on Canadian life. For some years past, the hard-working folk behind the Ireland-Canada Monument at Vancouver have sought every means to give formal recognition to the large contribution of Irish men and women to Canada. The committee are now making every endeavour to raise funds to erect the proposed memorial. If you can help, you will find a secure way of making a donation on the ICM website. My thanks for looking our way, and I really do hope you enjoyed the video.